Daniel and Abigail had always been adventurous, constantly seeking new experiences to share. As their fifth anniversary approached, they embarked on a thrilling camping trip to Torngat Mountains National Park, located in the remote wilderness of northern Canada. Little did they know that their journey would soon take an unexpected turn. Excitement filled the air as they set up their cozy tent amidst the breathtaking landscape. The Torngat Mountains stood tall, their majestic peaks covered in a pristine blanket of snow. The couple's spirits were high as they marveled at the untouched beauty surrounding them. Daniel surprised Abigail with a delicious breakfast spread on the morning of their anniversary. As they sat near their tent, savoring the moment, the tranquility of the wilderness embraced them. The couple enjoyed a heartwarming conversation, reminiscing about their journey and expressing gratitude for their love and shared adventures. However, fate had a different plan for their celebration. Out of nowhere, a mid-sized polar bear emerged from behind a nearby rock. Its enormous size and formidable presence startled both Daniel and Abigail. The couple froze in fear, their breakfast forgotten as the bear closed in on them. In a desperate attempt to protect his beloved, Daniel tried to scare off the bear, shouting and waving his arms. But the bear, driven by hunger and instinct, lunged toward Abigail. It happened so fast that Daniel barely had time to react. Abigail let out a piercing scream as the polar bear's jaws clamped around her arm. The pain was excruciating and fear coursed through her veins. Daniel, fueled by a surge of adrenaline, jumped into action. He fought tooth and nail with bravery and sheer desperation to rescue Abigail from the bear's grip. Though wounded and terrified, Abigail also found strength within herself to fight back. She kicked and punched the bear, summoning every ounce of willpower to survive. In the midst of the struggle, Daniel managed to grab a nearby camping axe and deliver a powerful blow to the bear's head. Stunned by the blow, the bear momentarily released its grip on Abigail. Seizing the opportunity, Daniel and Abigail scrambled to their feet and ran toward a nearby cluster of trees. Their hearts pounded in their chests as they sought refuge, desperately hoping the bear would not pursue them. Minutes turned into hours as the couple remained hidden, breathless and shaken. The wilderness around them seemed eerily quiet, as if it too held its breath. Eventually, they cautiously emerged from their hiding spot, their bodies aching and their clothes torn. They quickly realized that Abigail's injuries were severe and they needed immediate medical attention. Using their survival skills, they reached an emergency satellite phone they had packed in case of such an eventuality. After a nerve-wracking wait, a rescue team arrived and airlifted Abigail to the nearest hospital. Miraculously, Abigail survived the attack, though her recovery journey would be long and arduous. She underwent multiple surgeries and received extensive therapy to regain mobility in her injured arm. Throughout it all, Daniel stood by her side, offering unwavering support and love. The incident in the Torngat Mountains National Park forever changed their lives. It taught them the fragility of human existence and the importance of cherishing every moment. Their bond as a couple grew stronger as they navigated the challenges together, appreciating the gift of life and their shared love for each other. Anastasia is a 15-year-old girl vacationing in Kaktavik, a remote village in Alaska. She's living in Canada, but she has relatives such as her aunt, uncle, and cousins living permanently here in the town. She was most likely raised in a city, but she's a girl who's always curious about her surroundings and wants to explore more. When she discovers that she has relatives living in a remote village in Alaska, she wants to go there for an adventure and meet different people simultaneously. When she arrived at Kaktavik, it was different. However, she was delighted to finally see her aunt, uncle, and cousins for the first time. She was close to her cousin Jed the most since they were the same age. Upon Anastasia's arrival, Jed always ensures that his cousin feels safe and welcome in their home. He always talks to his cousin about everything in their community. 
while Anastasia talks about her experiences in Canada. Since Jed was born and raised here, he has been fascinated by Anastasia's stories about living in the place where she resides. As Anastasia's stay in the place gets longer, she gets more inclined toward the lifestyle that the people have here. She always talks to the locals, walks around the village to greet others, and tries every fantastic food she served. The people in town like her, and she also loved being here. Aside from walking around town, Jed also takes her near the coast to watch the sea in front of them. Anastasia has developed a liking for looking out at the sea, so Jed always takes her to the beach to relax. After a few weeks in Kaktovik, today's Anastasia's last day here. She wanted to make the most out of her stay, but unfortunately there was news circulating around town that there were polar bear sightings at the coast again. Anastasia's aunt tells her to stay inside the home, making her feel unhappy. During the afternoon, Jed visits Anastasia's room and sees her reading a book. Jed asks how she's doing, to which Anastasia answers that she's not feeling well since she wants to see the sea for the last time. Jed tells her that he has some good news. Polar bears were now cleared from the area where they were viewing the sea. Anastasia's eyes lit up as she stood up from the bed and told Jed they should go there and see the ocean for the last time. The two of them immediately walked to the coast, and it was true, the polar bears were now gone. But still, Anastasia felt something wrong with the surroundings, but she thought it was only her thinking. Jed and Anastasia sat on the coast, staring at the sea in front of them. Anastasia felt happy to spend her last vacation day with her favorite cousin and do their favorite thing together. They spent an hour sitting there and talking about random things when they decided to head home. As they stood up, something unexpected and terrifying began to unfold. As soon as Anastasia stood up and turned around, a young polar bear who was medium-sized greeted her, standing right in front of her. She covered her mouth and tried not to freak out, as Jed was also surprised since another villager told him that the polar bears were now cleared from the coast. Jed whispers that they should move slowly so the polar bear wouldn't see them as a threat. Anastasia nodded as they kept eye contact with the bear while slowly trying to back away. However, the polar bear growled before charging straight at Anastasia, tackling her down to the rocky ground. Anastasia heard her back as the polar bear began to scratch her face and shoulders with his claws. Terrified, Jed began to panic as he tried to think of a way to save his cousin. Anastasia screamed in pain as she could feel the polar bear's claws scratch her skin. Jed suddenly decided to pick up stones from the ground and throw them at the bear. The bear was flinching, but it kept attacking Anastasia and even attempted to bite her head. Anastasia continued to cry out in pain as the bear showed no mercy and grabbed her arm to bite it. She screamed loud enough for other villagers to hear since she could feel the polar bear's teeth piercing her skin. She tried to fight the bear with her own strength, but it was useless compared to the animal's strength. Suddenly, a group of male villagers arrived, one carrying a torch and one carrying a stun baton. The villagers first made loud noises to startle the bear, followed by a villager approaching the bear with a torch and swaying it to get rid of the enormous animal. When the bear was backing off, one of the villagers grabbed and carried Anastasia to take her to the nearest village medical center for treatment. The doctor said she needed to be taken back to Canada immediately to recover as she suffered from puncture wounds and scratches on her face, torso, arms, and lower body. She also suffered from injuries to her back. The next day, Anastasia was immediately taken back to Canada by plane as she continued her recovery there. Meanwhile, the officials of Kaktovik advised the residents not to go near the coast temporarily until the area was completely cleared of the enormous animals. Ivan was an engineering student from Moscow who formed a solid friendship with a few of his colleagues, even getting to the point where they created a tradition of camping in remote regions of their country every year. They met during their freshman year in 1999 and stayed close throughout their bachelor's and master's programs. In total, there were four of them, Ivan, Marta, 
Alex, and Myla. Not all of them studied the same subjects, but shared interests brought them together. In 2002, when all of them had finally finished their bachelor's programs, they decided a more fitting journey was in order, so they planned to go to Greenland. It was much further away, hundreds of miles away from their country, but they were excited nonetheless. It took some prying with their parents for permission to go, so organizing the trip extended into multiple weeks. Eventually, they managed to convince Myla's parents to let her go. During their final visit to her home, they were all waiting in front of her apartment when she came out carrying her backpack. Her mother followed closely behind, sternly warning everyone to care for her only daughter before melting into a kind smile, one of pride for how they all grew up. They were finally on their way, and the six-hour flight passed quickly through friendly banter and pleasant conversation. They arrived in Nuuk late at night and immediately went to their accommodation to rest. They decided to get lunch together the next morning before seeing the sights. They walked around the town, taking everything in, even meeting some of the locals who were very friendly and inviting. After sampling some local cuisine and spirits, one asked a local about good camping locations. They immediately mentioned the small settlement of Kangek, where they could spend a few days and return to the capital. The idea seemed like a good one, and their decision was set when the local told them that a man near the coast would take them there for cheap. They talked to the man, and he said that the boat would only be able to take them there the following day, as he had business to tend to at the capital. The group got his number and returned to the town to enjoy more sights. They had drinks later in the night and retired for the evening. The following day, like clockwork, the captain was on his boat waiting for them to show up. They packed provisions for multiple days, and within a few hours, they were at the settlement. They were in awe of Greenland's beauty without the city's busyness. Ivan thanked the captain and shook hands with him. He told the young man that he would be back in two days from then, and they should be ready for that. The rest of their day went along smoothly. They pitched their tents first so they wouldn't have to do it later, and afterward, they took a walk along the shoreline admiring the views. Ivan and Alex went together one way, while Myla and Marta went the other. Eventually, they made a full circle around the settlement and decided to make a fire using some of the firewood other visitors left. The houses here were derelict and worn down, but not unsightly. The girls prepared some meat and potatoes for everyone, and they greeted the night laughing, joking, and reminiscing about their fondest memories. When the night dimmed, they all felt tired and decided to sleep. Ivan and Myla shared a tent, while Marta and Alex had their own. At night, Ivan was awakened by a strange shuffling noise around his tent. The shadow overlapping the moonlight was massive, and as he attempted to open his tent flap, he felt an immense weight come pressing down on him from outside. He could barely move, and as he struggled to breathe, the side of the tent was slashed open to reveal the massive head of a polar bear illuminated by the moonlight. He screamed in surprise and immediately pulled his arms up to protect himself, but it was useless. By then, the bear had already started its attack, and few things would drive it away from its prey. Ivan felt the bear's sharp claws dig deep into his sides and the bear's razor-sharp teeth bite into his arms. He screamed in agony as the others rushed out of their tents. Alex was in front, and when he saw what was happening, he told the girls to stay back. With Ivan screaming in the background, he picked up a large rock near one of their tents and heaved it above his head. He later noted that it made no sense for him to even be able to pick the rock up, given its weight, but he chalked that up to adrenaline. As he looked down on his friend getting mauled, he tossed the rock, hitting the bear squarely on the head. It let go of his arms immediately and stumbled back, grunting wearily. It assumed a threatening stance once more and seemed to want to charge in again, but by that point, Alex and the girls stood in front of Ivan and screamed as loudly as they could. It was a standoff, and the bear slowly turned around and ran in the opposite direction. They stood there in abject terror, as they had no idea what to do should the bear decide to return, so they just watched it, 
and as soon as it was far enough away, they turned toward Ivan, who was whimpering in pain. They started a new fire and bundled him up in blankets after tending to his wounds. He is alive today, but if the attack had continued for a moment more, his wounds would have been too severe for them to mend. They stayed by his side until the morning, with Alex sitting on the shore in the early morning hours and calling for the fishermen to hurry. When he filled him in on the situation, they carried Ivan back to the boat and immediately started the journey back to Nuke. He was pale and his speech was fuzzy, but he was still breathing properly, so they were hopeful. They got to Nuke fairly quickly, and the fishermen immediately phoned emergency services to come and get Ivan. When he was admitted to the nearby clinic, his friends waited with bated breath, hoping that Ivan's body had no lasting damage. After what seemed like hours, the doctors finally came out and informed them that Ivan would pull through and there would be minimal lasting damage to his tendons. They were relieved and started planning a trip back as they knew Ivan would like to be with his family. The flight back to Moscow was uneventful, but the earful they all received from Ivan's parents after they heard about what had happened would be something they would never forget. They felt horrible that they could not do more for their friend, but ultimately he said he was grateful for them being there that day and he would not be alive if it weren't for Alex's quick thinking. Alaska is home to a wide array of animal species from deer and foxes to several species of bear. Because of the variety of its flora and fauna, Alaska is visited by thousands of tourists every year, most of them wanting to explore the wilderness and take in the breathtaking sights. However, the beauty of nature does not come without a stern reminder of its potency, as many of the animals you encounter in Alaska are dangerous and will attack humans on sight. We are not talking about the massive antlers of the moose or the sharp talons of eagles. We are talking about the most dangerous animal you see the least of, the polar bear. Polar bears are furry tanks equipped with razor-sharp claws and a destructive tendency to seek out humans for food. The story we have for you today concerns August Mills, a young programmer from California who wanted to take a vacation and explore some colder climates. He was usually an outgoing and adventurous person, so he decided that his next trip would have to be Alaska, as he had heard great things about it. August asked his friends and some family members if they would accompany him, but it was impossible to align their schedules, so he decided to go alone. He had previously traveled to the Swiss Alps and countries like Hungary, so this was nothing out of the ordinary. August ensured his schedule was clear for one week, and booked the earliest flight to Anchorage. Anchorage is a highly populated part of Alaska, so August wanted to spend some time interacting with the people and the culture before flying out to the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge to enjoy the scenery and observe some animals. His stay in Anchorage was excellent. He felt safe there and found the people to be a joy, and he looked forward to his return to the refuge. The guide said there were many activities for tourists to try out in the refuge, so August was looking forward to some fishing and kayaking, which he loved to do in his spare time. On the fourth day of his one-week trip, August's plane left Anchorage in the early morning, and he was at the refuge shortly. When he arrived, he remembered feeling great amazement and gratitude for being able to visit such a location. Greeted by a guide, August received all the information he would need for the next two days he would be spending there, and when he expressed his wish to fish and kayak, the guide precisely told him what they would be doing. Overjoyed, August went to the camping ground to join the rest of the group, heavy backpack and tent in tow. The following night was spent chatting with the other tourists, laughing and having fun. They would set out for the nearby river to fish for a few hours and leave kayaking for the following day. When the group reached the river, they all set down their equipment and took comfortable seats by the river. All was going well until the guide started looking worried, prompting a few tourists to ask what the matter was. He said that he was trembling with excitement and pointed to the horizon. Hundreds of yards away, hunting a flock of birds, a massive polar bear was so large that they could recognize what it was from such a vast distance. 
Some group members voiced their concerns and wanted to return to the campsite, but the guide assured them that everything was fine, as the bear was preoccupied with its prey and would not even see them. The group continued fishing, occasionally glancing to the distance where the bear still was, but it never moved toward them. The day ended with the group catching a considerable number of fish and roasting them over a fire near their campsite. By the time everyone started eating, they had forgotten all about the bear and spent the rest of the night in high spirits and pleasant conversation. Late in the night, August decided that he had had enough and would head back to the tent. Before long, the rest of them retired as well, and August enjoyed his time alone as he listened to the serene silence of the Yukon. Just as he was about to drift off to sleep, his peace was disrupted by screaming near his tent. It was a woman's scream. Fear took hold of him, as he had no idea what had happened, so he couldn't move for a few moments. When his thoughts settled, August turned over in his sleeping bag and stumbled out of his tent after slipping on his boots. The air was frigid and the wind stung his face, but August managed to see what was happening. The young lady he had been talking to after dinner was outside her tent, running toward August through the intense snow. She grabbed his arm and moved behind him, sobbing uncontrollably. She was barefoot. August could not fathom what could have made her feel this way, so he directed her toward his tent, where she could at least get a coat. His instruction was cut short by an overwhelming force crashing into his back and pinning him against the frozen ground. The hot feeling of drool and teeth was on the back of his neck, and just as he felt them start to pierce flesh, he pulled his arms over his neck. The young lady was still screaming to the side as she watched the massive polar bear maul August. The rest of the tents began to stir, and the other group members saw the commotion. They rushed to the scene in a flurry of shouting and screaming, hoping to scare the bear off. Not knowing what else to do, one of the tourists hurled a nearby rock onto the bear, which only made it grunt as it thrust its claws deeper into August. August could not move because of the sheer weight of the bear, and he was shrieking from the pain of the bear's claws digging into his back. The more the attack went on, the more he could feel the skin peeling as the smell of iron intensified. The guide also rushed to the scene carrying a revolver and a small can of bear spray. He moved in front of the bear and unloaded the can into its face, but it barely flinched. The only thing he accomplished was causing August to feel the worst burning pain he had ever felt. His wounds were covered in the bear spray due to the intense wind. Seeing that the bear spray had no effect and August was bleeding intensely, the guide pulled out his revolver and shot the bear square in the shoulder. The shot echoed across the campsite and the bear appeared to stop the assault. The bear pressed its paw against August's back and lunged at the guide. August could feel the pressure rise through the pain in his wounds. He could feel several ribs crack under the severe strain. The air in his lungs was expelled and he was left squirming on the ground in pain. The guide was knocked on his back and the bear went for his throat, but he thought quickly and pointed the gun at the bear before unloading it entirely. The sound was deafening, but the bear's assault finally stopped as its lifeless body collapsed on the guide, pinning him to the ground. The rest of the group had to act quickly because August was stuck. The guide was also getting suffocated by the bear. Within a few minutes, August was by a quickly made fire and two people were tending to his wounds, while the rest of the group heaved the massive animal off the guide. Later, reports said that August had passed out from the immense pain and the blood loss, but thanks to one of the tourists being a paramedic and the first aid kit on standby, he was stabilized. Emergency services were called, but it took them an hour to get to the scene. When they arrived, August was accepted into their care and airlifted to the nearest hospital. He spent multiple weeks in recovery, undergoing painful treatments to mend his lost skin and the broken bones. But members of the group that he became friends with regularly checked in and provided support. They extended their trip by an additional week to ensure August was okay. It took many months, but August made a full recovery and decided that he would much rather visit warm climates from that point on.
The next story is about a tour guide within the abandoned Soviet coal mining town called Pyramiden. This town was visited by tourists because of its eerie and spooky vibe, and they wanted to catch some paranormal experiences. Still, this tour guide experienced something more terrifying than encountering a ghost or paranormal creature. Johan was a seasoned Norwegian tour guide who had spent most of his life exploring his homeland's rugged and remote landscapes. He possessed an adventurous spirit and an unyielding love for the great outdoors. His passion for sharing the beauty of Norway with others led him to become a highly sought-after guide, specializing in leading groups through some of the country's most captivating and off-the-beaten-path destinations. One summer, Johan embarked on an expedition to Pyramiden, an abandoned Soviet coal mining town on the remote Svalbard archipelago. Located deep within the Arctic Circle, Pyramiden had been deserted for decades, its once thriving community now reduced to a ghost town frozen in time. It was a hauntingly beautiful place, and Johan believed it would be the perfect setting to showcase Norway's rich history and captivating landscapes. Johan had carefully assembled a group of adventurous tourists, each eager to experience the mysterious allure of Pyramiden. They embarked on their journey, braving the harsh Arctic climate and traversing treacherous terrains. The group was in high spirits, their excitement palpable as they approached their destination. Little did they know, danger lurked in the frozen wilderness. As Johan led the group through the dilapidated streets of Pyramiden, a sudden and bone-chilling roar echoed through the abandoned buildings. Johan's heart raced as he recognized the source of the noise, an enormous polar bear, awoken from its slumber by their presence. Fear gripped Johan's heart as he quickly assessed the situation. With limited options and no time to lose, he instructed the tourists to stand their ground, ensuring they remained as calm and composed as possible. The polar bear, its massive form dwarfing everything in its path, charged toward the group with a ferocity that could only be born out of the wild. Johan knew that their only chance of survival lay in fighting back. Drawing upon his years of outdoor experience, he mustered every ounce of strength and courage within him. Armed with a flare gun and a small pocket knife, he confronted the polar bear head on, hoping to deter its attack. The encounter was brutal and unforgiving. The polar bear's immense strength was unmatched, its claws tearing through Johan's protective clothing, leaving deep gashes and drawing copious amounts of blood. Johan fought valiantly, using every technique he knew to defend himself against the relentless predator. With one wrong move, Johan was instantly taken down by the polar bear before it started to bite his head, face, and shoulders. The tourists were terrified but were determined to think of a way to distract and deter the polar bear away to keep it from attacking Johan any further. Johan screamed as he tried to stretch his arms upward, landing a punch on the polar bear's large face. The polar bear grew more aggressive as it growled and started to scratch Johan's face causing him to scream in excruciating pain and concern the tourists even more. Just as all hope seemed lost, shouts and cries broke through the Arctic stillness. The tourists, refusing to stand idly by, had gathered their wits and formed a united front. Armed with whatever they could find, they unleashed a barrage of rocks and makeshift weapons at the polar bear distracting it and giving Johan a momentary respite before standing up and getting on his two feet despite his injuries gained from the polar bear's attack. Seizing the opportunity, Johan mustered his last reserves of energy. With adrenaline pumping through his veins, he maneuvered skillfully, his knife finding its mark, striking the bear with precision. The wounded beast, realizing the odds were no longer in its favor, retreated disappearing into the vast white landscape. In the aftermath of the harrowing encounter, Johan's injuries were severe, his body battered and broken. The tourists immediately rallied together, using their first aid skills to stabilize the bleeding and stabilize him until help arrived. They sent out an emergency distress signal, alerting the authorities of the incident and providing their exact location. 
Rescue teams swiftly responded to the call, navigating the unforgiving terrain to reach the group. Johan was airlifted to safety, receiving urgent medical attention that saved his life. His injuries were extensive and the road to recovery would be long, but he had survived an encounter that would forever be etched in his memory. Mac is just one of the 16 campers who signed up to camp at Longyearbyen in Norway's Svalbard Islands. The Svalbard Islands were well known for having one of the best glacier views and Arctic wildlife. He has been dreaming and saving up for this very moment that he can finally go to a place within the Arctic, and now it has come true. Mac always wanted to witness the Arctic with his own two eyes and see a polar bear up close. Longyearbyen, along with other towns, is also known for having high concentrations of polar bears. Due to the high number of polar bears visiting Svalbard, attacks were reported almost yearly. However, this didn't stop Mac from going there. Mac and the 15 other campers were taken to a campsite near the coast. As they arrived, there were 16 tents already, and they had to choose which was theirs. The guides were friendly, as well as the other campers, so Mac didn't have a problem befriending them. After choosing his ten, Mac unpacked his belongings and greeted the other campers. He offered them some biscuits and tea, which the other campers happily accepted and shared with him while they talked with each other. As nighttime came, Mac and the other campers decided to make a bonfire and eat together. After setting up the bonfire, they sat together and shared random things. Although Mac doesn't know one of the campers, he enjoys talking to them and sharing this particular moment. After a couple of hours of talking and having fun, they all decided to rest in their tents. Mac also went inside his tent and lay down to sleep. Since he couldn't fall asleep quickly, he began reading his favorite book to feel drowsy. He also opened his tent and let his feet out to feel the cold night breeze against them. Unfortunately, Mac still couldn't fall asleep despite reading his favorite book and feeling the cold wind against his feet. He felt annoyed since he wanted to fall asleep so badly because Mac was tired of all the traveling he had done to get there. He grabbed another book from his bag and started reading it to make himself feel drowsy. As he read his book, the cold air brushed through his feet again, sending shivers down his spine. Mac was focusing on his book and didn't notice what would happen to him in a few seconds. Mac became confused when he felt something tickle his feet. Since it was dim outside, he couldn't see who or what was causing him to feel this way. He initially just thought that maybe it was the wind, but he was alarmed when he suddenly heard a huffing sound of a wild animal nearby. He dropped his book and lifted his head to see what was outside, only to see a polar bear sniffing his feet. Mac panicked as he screamed and kicked the polar bear in the face. He thought that this would scare the bear away, but things just got worse. The polar bear growled as it bit Mac's feet and slowly dragged him outside the tent. Mac squirmed and screamed for help, which awakened the other campers and prompted them to leave their tents. When the other camper saw what was happening, while the others called the guides for help. Meanwhile, the polar bear dragged Mac near the coast and went on top of him. Mac continued to scream as the bear became angrier and slashed his face with its sharp claws. Mac could feel his face bleed as his pain from it was excruciating. A few minutes later, the guides arrived with one carrying a rifle and aimed it at the bear. There, the guide fired a shot which instantly killed the animal. After the bear had been shot dead, the other guys carried Mac and took him to a hospital nearby. His face was severely damaged, and he suffered bite wounds on his feet and injuries on his back. However, he survived and has a higher chance of recovering than passing away. Thor is a healthy two-year-old polar bear at a zoo in Detroit. Everyone in the zoo loves him the visitors, the staff, and his handler, Alan. He was born and raised in captivity, so he's gotten close to everyone, especially Alan and their zoo veterinarian named Malcolm. Along with the veterinary assistant named Lena, 
Malcolm conducts animal health checkups and monthly vaccinations for all animals in the zoo to test them for parasite infections and maintain their overall health. Of course, this also includes checking up on Thor. Checking up on Thor seems like a problem at first, but the polar bear actually has been trained through positive reinforcement by Alan about behaviors that help with giving medical care. Over two years, Alan has patiently trained Thor to stand up, sit, and lie down. Also, there is a barrier between Malcolm and Thor whenever a checkup is ongoing. At every checkup, Thor is very obedient whenever Alan asks him to do something to help Malcolm check his body. He's one of the few animals in the zoo that was obedient and quiet at checkups, and he's been impressive ever since. Aside from being impressive at checkups, Thor is also remarkable when it comes to entertaining visitors. He's been made sure to grow up in a positive environment so that his natural aggressiveness as a polar bear will be altered even slightly. Today, Malcolm and Lena will conduct a blood test for all animals in the zoo. This will be included in their weekly checkup, which will test the animals for any infections in their bodies. Of course, Alan isn't worried since Thor is healthy and hasn't been at risk for parasite infections or illnesses lately. After checking the first few animals at the zoo, it was Thor's turn for the checkup. Unfortunately, the metal barrier they'd been using has been broken, so they needed a substitute barrier that was not as solid as the metal barrier. Alan needed help from four other handlers to help maintain Malcolm and Lena's safety and make Thor behave nicely during the entire checkup process. Malcolm smiled as he approached Thor behind the barrier at his enclosure. Alan then signaled Thor to sit appropriately, which the polar bear did obediently. Malcolm and Lena were delighted when they saw Thor nicely behaving when they were around. This means that Alan did great in taking care of the bear as it grew up. Malcolm proceeded with the checkup as he kneeled and got close to Thor, quietly sitting behind the barrier. Alan told the bear to approach Malcolm and sit down, which Thor immediately obeyed. Everything was going fine, but Malcolm could already sense something wrong with Thor, as he seemed to behave differently than in the previous checkups. Thor might be obeying Alan's orders, but every time he follows, he lightly slaps the floor with his paws and makes small huffing sounds. Alan isn't even noticing it, but Malcolm does. Malcolm took a deep breath as the bear approached him and got his arm out of the barrier through Alan's orders to draw blood from the bear. Malcolm still hears Thor cough. This time, it's louder and audible enough for Alan to hear. Alan was also surprised to hear Thor huff, since it was unusual for the bear to behave that way. He only hears Thor make that sound when he's hungry or irritated, but in today's case, it's different. Malcolm asked Alan if he should continue to draw blood from the bear or continue with the checkup the next day. But Alan insisted that Thor did great on his previous checkups, and maybe he was just showing this behavior out of nowhere. Malcolm was convinced and told Lena to hand him the syringe that he'll be using to draw blood from Thor's arm. Alan carefully tells Thor to place his paw on Malcolm's shoulders so they can draw blood easier from the bear, which Thor follows. Malcolm became more nervous as Thor's huffs were getting loud and the barrier between them wasn't even solid in the first place. Alan tries to shush Thor quietly, but the bear won't stop and is even acting weirder now. Malcolm lifts the syringe and carefully leans closer to inspect Thor's arm. The bear's paws were resting on his shoulders, which is why he was extremely nervous and even sweating. As soon as he caressed the bear's arm, the unexpected happened. Thor suddenly lifts his arms on Malcolm's shoulders and slashes Malcolm's face with his claw, surprising everyone in the enclosure. Malcolm was so hurt by the attack that he collapsed and yelled in agony. Alan rushed to hold the barrier since it slightly moved out of its place. But it was too late. The polar bear suddenly jumped out and went on top of Malcolm. Alan tried to stop Thor from attacking Malcolm, but got harshly pushed away by the bear, who continued to claw Malcolm's body from the head down to his torso. 
Lena could only cry out as Alan told her to get help from other staff and handlers outside, which she did immediately. Alan tried to neutralize Thor by shouting at him and giving him orders, but it was useless. Malcolm tried to fight back by throwing punches at Thor's face, which angered the polar bear even more. Alan tried to stop Thor, but got bruised and wounded by getting clawed and pushed by the bear. The two of them were now bloody when Lena arrived with handlers, one carrying a tranquilizer dart gun to neutralize the aggressive polar bear. The handler immediately aimed the gun at Thor and fired it without hesitation. Thor suddenly bawled out before collapsing unconscious on the floor, freeing Malcolm from its attack. However, Malcolm also fell unconscious as the other handlers carried him and Alan out of the enclosure to bring them to a hospital. Malcolm and Alan miraculously survived. After the attack, the zoo temporarily closed as they decided to transfer Thor into a secluded enclosure until his aggressive behavior no longer threatened the people in the zoo, especially Alan and Malcolm. Johan is a man in his 20s, living with his four-year-old daughter, Agnes, in Denmark. The two of them have been alone together ever since Agnes's mother sadly passed away after giving birth to her. Now Johan is a single father who works hard to care for his young daughter. Agnes is a brilliant girl at such a young age. She knows how to speak complete sentences, understand complex questions, write her own name, and even name a few animals. Agnes loves animals, especially dogs and bears. She has developed a liking for bears, so Johan takes her to the zoo near their home. The zoo where Johan takes his daughter has a local polar bear named Magnus, and Agnes loves Magnus so much. Sometimes, Johan and Agnes would stay almost a whole day at the zoo just for Agnes to see Magnus in its enclosure and talk to the bear. Johan finds this adorable so he always takes his daughter to the zoo. Magnus's enclosure is situated a few feet below the zoo, so visitors have to view him from above through a protective fence to avoid falling below. Many visitors visited the zoo to see Magnus and were as delighted as Johan and Agnes. Today, Johan picked Agnes up from kindergarten and surprised her by taking her to the zoo to revisit Magnus. When Agnes learned of this, she was so happy and excited to go to the zoo like it was her first time. Every time Johan sees his daughter happy, it softens his feelings of loneliness since his wife passed away. As they reached the zoo, Johan was surprised to see a lot of visitors, especially in Magnus' enclosure. Johan decided to take Agnes to a nearby fast food restaurant first to get her her favorite food and eat before going to Magnus' chamber. After eating the fast food, Johan decided to take Agnes to the zoo, but still, there were a lot of visitors at Magnus' enclosure. Johan thought of an idea and carried Agnes on his shoulders before excusing himself through the crowd to let them through. Luckily, the people allowed him to be in the front, which made Agnes happy again. Agnes became very excited and clapped her hands, which made Johan happy when he heard his daughter laugh and sing. When Magnus went close, Agnes became excited and danced while sitting on her father's shoulders. Johan tells his daughter to stop dancing, but Agnes gets more excited when Magnus suddenly stands up and looks at the visitors above. The little girl began to sway her body, which made it hard for Johan to balance himself. Agnes was uncontrollable and kept dancing, making Johan rock his body to balance himself and his daughter on his shoulders. Suddenly, Johan accidentally tripped while trying to balance, causing him and his daughter to fall into the enclosure's pool. The visitors were shocked and terrified, since Johan and Agnes both fell into the pool inside Magnus's chamber. Johan immediately picks Agnes up from the pool as the little girl begins to cry from being hurt by the fall. Magnus notices the intruders in his enclosure and starts charging at Johan and Agnes. Johan didn't know where to run or hide, so he just wrapped Agnes tightly into his arms as the polar bear pushed and attacked him, making him collapse to the ground with his arms wrapped around his daughter. 
Magnus began clawing and scratching Johan's back as Johan endured the pain to protect his daughter from getting attacked. Some handlers arrived at the enclosure carrying rubber bullet guns, but screamed and yelled at the bear first to get it back to its cage at the far side of the chamber. However, Magnus didn't stop as he was now trying to bite Johan's head, with Johan still clinging to his daughter to protect her. He can now feel the blood drenching his back, but he still wants to protect Agnes, even if he is hurting. The handlers had no choice but to take Magnus down using rubber bullets. They fired several rubber bullets to stop Magnus and get it to run to its cage before going down to save Johan and Agnes. Johan and Agnes were immediately brought to a nearby hospital for treatment. Johan suffered from severe wounds on his back, while Agnes's back was slightly injured from the fall. The zoo management then took action to improve their facilities for the safety of their visitors. Juliet, Evie, Azalea, and Colette were female scientists studying beluga whales. They've been to different places where beluga whales can be found and were impressing people with their findings. They run a YouTube channel together that discusses sea animals present exclusively within the Arctic and has a lot of subscribers already. For their following study about beluga whales, the scientists decided to go to Churchill in Manitoba, Canada, which is renowned as the polar bear capital of the world. However, this place is also a great spot to see beluga whales in the wild. Because of this, the scientists were intrigued and decided to spend a week studying beluga whales. Upon their arrival at the town, they were assisted by two guides named Raphael and Beatrice, who were also residents of the place for many years. They were the ones helping the visitors that went to Churchill, and they were deemed friendly by many people. They assisted the scientists to one large cabin situated on the town premises. Juliet, Evie, Azalea, and Colette were delighted to have a spacious place to fit all their belongings and adequately accommodate them for their trip. After arranging their luggage and belongings, the four scientists left the cabin only to see the two guides waiting for them. Then the guides decided to tour them around town and tell them about its history, including its popularity of having a high concentration of polar bears in the wild. The scientists were fascinated as they began to record everything the guides had to say. Raphael and Beatrice also showed them some landmarks within the town, such as shops, schools, hospitals, and even restaurants. Every resident that stumbles upon the road is friendly, which makes them feel pleased with their kind and hospitable attitude. After the tour around town, the four scientists returned to their cabin to rest and plan what they had to do to study beluga whales. After hours of planning, they decided to rest and prepare for a long day ahead. A couple of hours passed, and Evie suddenly woke up from sleep due to a bad dream. She tried to wake the other women, but it was useless. Evie tried to fall asleep again by closing her eyes, but it was also useless. She tried to listen to white noise, but it wasn't even enough for her to fall asleep. Their cabin also has a kitchen, making it easier for her to cook anything she likes. There, she decided to make her favorite food, which was pancakes. She grabs her ingredients from one of her bags and starts cooking. Despite the noise she's been making in the kitchen, the three other women were still asleep. After making the pancakes, the kitchen was a mess. Evie also cooked pasta, which is why there was a lot of trash and dirt in the kitchen. After finishing her food, she immediately cleaned the mess and collected the garbage she'll be throwing out at the dumpster beside their cabin outside. It was still around midnight, so Evie's surroundings were calm and quiet. She even hesitated to throw the trash outside since it was dark and cold. However, she just set aside her thoughts and threw the garbage outside herself. As she left the cabin, the cold wind immediately touched the exposed parts of her skin, making her shiver. Still, she insisted on throwing out the trash since she was already outside. As she turned the corner to head to the dumpster, she was surprised and horrified at the same time about what she saw. It was a mid-sized polar bear searching the dumpsters for food. Evie immediately took a few steps back, but unfortunately, the bear heard her and stopped searching the dumpsters to stare at her. 
Evie's knees were already trembling as her grip on the trash bag became tighter. She began to sweat profusely despite the cold because a polar bear was in front of her. The polar bear suddenly growled, and that's when Evie dropped the trash to the ground and screamed while trying to run. However, it was too late. Before she could run away from the bear after dropping the trash bag, it jumped at her and tackled her down to the ground, brutally attacking her. Evie struggled as she could feel suffocation due to the polar bear's weight. She tried to fight, but her strength couldn't match the polar bear's. The bear began biting her head, but she lifted her arms and tried to resist its bite. The polar bear became angrier and clawed Evie's face, causing her to scream. Juliet, Azalea, and Colette were wakened from their sleep when they heard Evie's haunting screams outside. The three scientists had exited their cabin just as the bear attacked Evie. They watched in horror while Evie was getting mauled to death. Colette rushed to Raphael and Beatrice Holmes for help while Juliet and Azalea grabbed their belongings and threw them at the bear to scare it away. A few minutes later, Colette arrived with Raphael, Beatrice, and other residents to rescue Evie from the bear. Raphael and three other men with stun batons approached the bear and electrocuted it, causing it to fall unconscious off Evie's body. The other residents, including Beatrice, grabbed Evie and carried her to a vehicle to take her to a nearby medical center. Raphael and the men thought of killing the bear who terrorized the scientists. Evie survived the attack. However, their study about beluga whales will be postponed, as they couldn't do it without Evie's help. Alaska is one of the most immense and breathtaking destinations for campers and tourists to visit year-round. There are over 665 square miles of nature to explore, but you will never be alone in the Alaskan wilderness. You can find many animal species, but the absolute apex predator of Alaska is the polar bear. Our next story is about Maddie Nichols, a young camping enthusiast who went to one of the camping cabins available in Anchorage, Alaska, to get away from the hustle and bustle of her life for a few nights. She found herself at the hands of death and loss in the worst way. Maddie arrived at her cabin in September with her two German shepherds, Bonnie and Lass, intending to stay there for a week. She made sure to bring the proper supplies and rented a small car with extra supplies in case of an emergency. The mountain air and scenery were always welcome when Maddie would feel too stressed, and her dogs just loved the freedom of running around the wilderness. She found that the previous inhabitant of the cabin had stacked up some wood for a new fire and left extra kindling in the hearth ready to light. She found this very helpful because it lowered the amount of work she had to do and meant she could start her vacation. Maddie spent the first day and the second morning unpacking her things, as she always liked to keep things neat. She didn't have to worry about her dogs because this was not their first time at the cabin and they knew their way around. On the third day of their stay, Maddie decided that it would be a good idea to go on a hike to the nearby river to cook food and relax, and it would be a good way for her dogs to get some exercise. They started for the river at 8 a.m. and were at their destination by 8.40 a.m. It wasn't a long hike, but it had some diverse terrain and the sights were amazing. Maddie set up a small fire by the river where she and her dogs sat down to eat their food. Bonnie and Lass would get some wet dog food, their favorite, while Maddie ate meat and potatoes in the small frying pan she brought. Halfway through the meal, Maddie noticed her dogs becoming restless, something they would usually never do. They backed away from their food and lightly growled in Maddie's direction. She was dumbfounded as she could not understand why her loyal dogs would behave this way, but she soon realized that the dogs were not looking at her, but behind her. As she turned around, she noticed movement in the bushes and stood up, pocket knife in hand, frozen in place. A few moments later, she saw the lumbering shape of a juvenile polar bear enter their field of view, after which Bonnie and Lass erupted into a frenzy of barks as they ran toward the bear, making it step back slightly. The bear had likely smelled the cooking food and dog food and thought it could scavenge something. However, it saw Maddie and started making its way forward. Maddie knew they stood no chance against a polar bear, 
so she gripped her pocket knife tighter and broke into a dead sprint back in their direction. Her eyes welled with tears as she heard her dogs whine as the bear growled and it all got quieter. Through sheer adrenaline, she ran back to the cabin where she closed the door and cried on the floor. After a while, the silence in the wilderness was broken by whining in the distance, progressively getting louder. Maddie dried her eyes and looked out the cabin window, only to see Bonnie and Lass on their way back. Bonnie was limping, and Lass was covered in blood, but they were okay. Maddie rushed out of the cabin and hugged her dogs tightly, rejoicing that they had come back alive. Apparently, they were distracting the bear as a team for Maddie to escape, and they sniffed their way around when the bear eventually gave up on chasing them. Maddie knew the most important thing was getting her dogs the necessary medical treatment, so she put Bonnie in the front seat of the car and Lass in the back while she rushed to get all their things packed. They were on the road in 10 minutes. Her dogs were in no danger when she reached the vet, and she was grateful they were okay. The Russian polar bear invasion that occurred in February 2019 was at the top of the news back then. A total of 52 polar bears have been seen entering the archipelago of Novaya Zemlya and terrorizing the people living near the main settlement, Belushia Guba, where they first entered. The bears started arriving at the town by December and gradually increased in numbers as time passed. Now, 52 polar bears have been terrorizing the city by February. Since the polar bears weren't leaving the area, authorities proclaimed a state of emergency on February 16th. In those months of the bears' invasion, many people were chased and attacked, and homes were entered and ravaged. Some of the bears even entered businesses and office buildings and attacked soldiers who were patrolling outside. It was so bad that people who needed to go to work were picked up by military vehicles to get to their jobs. Everyone was devastated and terrified of the polar bear's presence at that time. There were many stories from people living at Belushia Guba then. One of them was from an 18-year-old boy named Vlad, who was living with his sick mother, Mila. Vlad has been dreaming of going to Moscow to college, but unfortunately, he can't since he has to take care of his mother, who is sick with diabetes. Instead of studying, he works as a cashier at a shop near their home to provide her with medicine. He also does other errands around town to make the most of his time and earn more money. When polar bears invaded, he was greatly affected since he couldn't work correctly and provide for their needs at home. To be able to get to work or buy medicine within the town, he needs to catch a ride in a military vehicle that passes by their home. Vlad has seen how many polar bears had been outside, which terrifies him. One day, Vlad was finished cooking breakfast when his mother called him upstairs. He immediately went to his mother and was told that she just ran out of medicine and he needed to buy new ones. Vlad has the money to purchase new medication, but he knows that no military vehicles are roaming outside to pick up people who want to go to work or buy necessities. Vlad tells his mother he can buy medicine, but he can't go outside since there are no military vehicles to pick him up. His mother insisted that she needed the treatment since she was not allowed to miss a dose. Vlad had no choice but to agree and go outside to try and see if he could catch a military vehicle. Vlad wears his jacket and opens the door to take a peek outside for bears. Luckily, there were none so he waited patiently for a military vehicle to pass. The pharmacy where he purchases his mother's medicine is just a few blocks away from their home, but he still wouldn't want to risk getting ambushed by a polar bear. A few minutes passed, and there were still no signs of military vehicles on the street. Vlad assumes they are on a break, but he has no choice. He needs to get medicine for his mother, or she'll miss a dose. With that, Vlad bravely decided to walk to the pharmacy alone. Vlad kept his footsteps quiet as he walked down the street. His knees were trembling with every step, and he kept his eyes on his surroundings. So far, there were no signs of polar bears, so he continued walking to the pharmacy. He was now thinking he could get to the pharmacy safely, when suddenly he heard a huffing sound nearby. 
Before Vlad could even think of a place to hide, a mid-sized polar bear immediately leaped out of a post and attacked him, causing him to fall to the ground with his face first. The polar bear growled before slashing his back with his claw, making him cry out in pain. As the bear clawed his back painfully, Vlad covered his nape with his two hands. Vlad tried to squirm his body and stand up to fight the bear, but it was useless. He was there screaming and crying for help, hoping that someone would rescue him. Some people inside their homes opened their doors when they heard Vlad screaming, and they were horrified by the sight of it. One concerned citizen grabbed her phone and called the military for help, as Vlad was getting hopelessly and brutally attacked by the bear. His back was now drenched with blood, and he couldn't bear the pain anymore. A military vehicle rushed to the scene just minutes after, and five soldiers got out of the car to rescue Vlad. The driver of the vehicle was honking loudly to scare the bear away, as one soldier fired a shot from his gun beside the bear to scare it away. When the bear didn't get away, another soldier fired a shot beside it again, making it run away from Vlad. The soldiers immediately took Vlad inside their vehicle to the hospital. Before Vlad could fall unconscious, he told the soldiers to help his mother get her medicine. When they took Vlad to the hospital, the authorities decided to send caregivers to Vlad's home while he recovered from the polar bear attack. Despite the brutal attack, Vlad survived, but he needed to stay in the hospital for further recovery. Driven by a lifelong passion for animals, Adriana had always known her calling was safeguarding their well-being. She harbored an unwavering determination to dedicate her life to this cause from an early age. After years of unwavering dedication and relentless effort, her dream of becoming a veterinarian became a reality. However, little did she anticipate that her path would soon intersect with a life-altering encounter involving a polar bear. Adriana had been working at a renowned conservation center in the Netherlands, specializing in preserving Arctic species. It was a challenging yet rewarding job, and she felt privileged to work closely with these majestic creatures. One winter day, she received news that one of the resident polar bears, Aurora, had given birth to two adorable cubs. Filled with excitement and a sense of responsibility, Adriana made her way to the enclosure where Aurora and her cubs were housed. She followed all the necessary safety protocols, including ensuring the gates were securely locked and notifying her colleagues of her whereabouts. As Adriana entered the enclosure, she marveled at the sight before her. The cubs were nestled beside their mother, their white fur blending perfectly with the snow-covered ground. Adriana began her routine checkup with a gentle smile inspecting the cubs' health and ensuring they were thriving. Unbeknownst to her, a series of unfortunate events were about to unfold. A faulty latch on Aurora's cage had gone unnoticed, and as Adriana focused on the cubs, the mother bear seized the opportunity to break free. In a matter of seconds, Aurora was standing between Adriana and the exit, blocking her escape. Fear raced through Adriana's veins as she realized the danger she was in. She knew polar bears were powerful creatures, capable of great speed and aggression. Panic set in as she desperately searched for a way to protect herself. She reached for her tranquilizer gun, but it fell to the ground while she was struggling with the cage door. Sensing Adriana's vulnerability, Aurora let out a thunderous roar that echoed through the enclosure. The bear's massive paws struck the ground, shattering Adriana's spine. Aurora lunged at her with a swift and brutal movement, her razor-sharp teeth and claws poised to strike. Adriana's instincts kicked in, and she fought back with all her might. She used every ounce of strength and training to fend off the massive predator. Claws tore her flesh, leaving deep gashes, and powerful bites threatened to crush her bones. The sounds of their struggle filled the air, a terrifying symphony of roars, growls, and cries of pain. Despite the overwhelming odds, Adriana refused to give up. She fought with unwavering determination, desperately hoping for someone to come to her aid.
Finally, alerted by the commotion, her colleagues rushed to the enclosure. Armed with tranquilizer guns, they managed to subdue Aurora, forcing her into a temporary state of unconsciousness. Bloodied and battered, Adriana was immediately rushed to the hospital. Miraculously, she had survived the brutal attack despite her severe injuries. The doctors worked tirelessly to mend her wounds, both physical and emotional. News of Adriana's ordeal spread like wildfire, garnering sympathy and support from around the world. Her story served as a stark reminder of the risks faced by those who dedicated their lives to animal conservation. People admired her courage and resilience, grateful for her selfless dedication to these endangered creatures. After months of intense rehabilitation, Adriana made a remarkable recovery. Though physically and emotionally scarred, she refused to let fear dictate her future. With an even stronger resolve, she continued her work as a veterinarian, advocating for the protection and preservation of wildlife. Rupert is a Canadian reporter covering the news regarding climate change in his special report. For a segment, his team was assigned to cover and document how climate change affects the residents of Arviat, an Inuit hamlet in Nunavut, Canada. As they arrived in Arviat, they were warmly greeted by Scylla, a young boy in his teenage years who also serves as a guide for tourists or visitors coming into their town. He greeted Rupert and his team and guided them into their cabins, where they would temporarily stay until Rupert was done covering the special report about climate change. Rupert's team consisted of cameramen Mike and Ben, journalist Vivian, and assistant Noel. They are always together whenever Rupert is assigned to document a special report, and they've grown close to each other as time passes. As soon as Rupert's team entered their cabin, they fixed their belongings first with the help of Scylla. They were amazed by Scylla's hospitality towards them, even at such a young age. Rupert asked if Scylla could tour them around the town the next day and record everything they'll do for the particular report, to which Scylla cheerfully agreed. The next day, Scylla toured Rupert's team around the town. He first introduced them to the town's traditional cuisine, in which Scylla had some locals cook their specialties and let Rupert and his team taste them. Vivian was in charge of documenting the town's cuisine, which she considered uniquely exquisite and very appetizing. Next, the team visited some elders' homes and asked several questions by Rupert on how climate change has slowly affected their lives. This is where he started documenting the effects of climate change on the people living in the Arctic communities. Scylla, Rupert, and the rest of the group visited the town's snow-covered beach after speaking with some elderly residents. There, he documented the current weather in Arviat and how it differs from the previous years. The team was busy assisting Rupert, except for Vivian, who was photographing the environment surrounding them right now. Suddenly, Scylla mentioned the frequency of polar bear visits in the community. Rupert was surprised to know that polar bears often visit the community more than people could ever expect. But for the locals living there, it's a regular sight to see polar bears pass by, as long as they keep themselves safe in the comfort of their homes. Scylla also mentioned that the place where they were standing at the moment is where polar bears often rest and eat their food, scaring Rupert, Mike, Ben, and Noel. Scylla giggled and said that what he said was true but this was not the usual time when polar bears go to their specific spot, which relieved the team. They were all busy listening to Scylla when they could suddenly hear Vivian's bone-chilling screams at a distance, alarming them instantly. They immediately saw Vivian getting dragged by a young polar bear by her legs with its mouth, which scared Rupert and the team. Despite being terrified, Rupert instinctively rushed to Vivian and tried to fight the polar bear by punching it, but instead made the polar bear attack him instead of Vivian. The polar bear dropped Vivian and then charged at Rupert before bumping its massive body against him and throwing him to the ground. Rupert attempted to stand back up when the polar bear jumped on top of him and clawed his face. 
Mike, Ben, and Noel rushed to pick Vivian up, and Scylla ran immediately to the village while screaming to other villagers for help. Rupert was screaming in pain as the polar bear brutally clawed him in the head, face, arms, and torso. Blood was now running from his body as the polar bear showed no signs of stopping. Mike, Ben, Noel, and Vivian could only cry and scream in terror as they helplessly watched Rupert get attacked. They were too afraid to help him from the polar bear, knowing that they would also be attacked the way Rupert was. After a few seconds, Scylla arrived with four other townspeople, carrying fire torches and huge stones. Scylla and the townspeople immediately rushed to Rupert and the polar bear and started attempting to make loud noises while scaring the polar bear off with the fire torches. The bear began to flinch, but its body was still on top of Rupert until two townsmen began throwing huge stones at the polar bear's body. The polar bear bawled out in pain as it immediately ran away from the bloodied Rupert, leaving him unconscious on the ground. Scylla and the other citizens quickly picked Rupert up from the ground as Mike, Ben, Noel, and Vivian were relieved to have Rupert rescued from the polar bear. Scylla and the townspeople took Rupert and his team to a medical center where the doctors pronounced Rupert's condition critical and needed to be treated immediately. Luckily, Rupert's situation became miraculously stable after a few hours, but he needed to rest for a while. Vivian also suffered injuries to her body, for which recovery was necessary. After the incident, the authorities in Arviat decided to strengthen their measures regarding going into places with high concentrations of polar bears. Our third and final story took place on a remote Arctic research base, where Amir Marsh spent a few months examining the local wildlife and conducting research in his field. Since the station was fairly small, there was no need to have multiple people there, as the job was simple enough for one person to do. When he gave his statement, he said he did not remember where the base was and did not care to think about it too much due to the trauma. At the time of the incident, he was on the job for about two weeks out of the needed four, and the situation was as ordinary as it could be. The research post was similar to a small cabin, with stairs leading to the vast expanse of snow and a small cellar to keep his food frozen. Life was, by all accounts, miserable, but Amir enjoyed it all the same. He liked to write in his spare time, so the peace and quiet were great for inspiration. However, what happened during his third week at the post would forever tear down the safety of peace and quiet. On the third day of his third week at the post, Amir woke up as he usually did, around 5 a.m. Nothing was out of the ordinary, and he started a new chapter in his journal before having coffee and breakfast. He was supposed to go out and analyze some of the local ice for undisclosed reasons, so he packed some supplies in a bag and went for the door. As he tried to open it, it would not budge. He thought it strange that the door would freeze shut over a single night, especially given the heat emanating from his small fireplace, so he decided to shoulder it open. One strong shove later, the door still wouldn't move, so he applied more force. Being stuck in a frozen cabin would have been a terrible fate, so he had to get the door open. After a few moments of shoving, it finally gave way but with far too much noise than the door would usually make. As it opened, he felt the weight behind it shift gradually, followed by a slamming of something on the railing leading to the outside. He practically fell through the doorway and was met with a flash of white fur. It was a full-grown polar bear. The angle of the door opening made the bear move to the left side of it, where it was blocked into the corner of the railing by the door and a very surprised Amir. He screamed in surprise as he had never seen a bear of such proportions in the wild before. As the scream left his lungs, the bear responded in kind, growling quite loudly as it started walking toward him. He tried to back into the cabin as he came out, but the bear was simply faster than him and was an inch away in an instant. It slammed into Amir, tossing him over the railing, he could feel some bones crack as he fell to the ground, but that was no time to wallow in pain. 
The bear was moving down the railing quite quickly, and the only means by which Amir could survive was to dash to the small cellar where he kept his food. Just as he was nearing the cellar, he could hear the bear's heavy footsteps getting closer and closer. He pulled the door open and felt a crushing weight on his back, pushing him forward through the cracked open door. He came tumbling to the ground before suddenly stopping, followed by a sharp pain in his foot. He looked down. His foot was jammed in the door. The bear pressed all its weight against the door, trying to get inside. It could not, but the pressure of the door crushed Amir's shin, splitting the bones in two. He screamed in pain, but the pressure only intensified. It got to the point where he passed out from the pain, waking up who knows how many hours later. When he came to, the pain in his foot was present, but numb from the cold. He tried to move, but everything was aching. Somehow he managed to prop himself up on his elbows and saw that his foot was still in the doorway, but the bear was gone. He slowly stood up, balancing on his free leg, intending to open the door slightly to free his foot. As he stood up, he lost balance and fell backward, hearing a haunting, visceral noise of tendon snapping and skin ripping. When he sat back up to examine the situation, he felt the most intense pain of his life as he realized his foot was no longer attached to his leg. The pain was unbearable, but he knew he had to act quickly. He pulled his belt out and bit down on it, hoping to decrease the pain to a slight degree, but it barely did anything. He hopped on his free leg out of the cellar and up the railing back to the comforting warmth of his station. He threw a single log on the fire, tied some cloth around his frozen stump of a leg, and eased himself into bed. There was a satellite phone he would use only in the direst of emergencies, so he inputted the number and explained his situation. A team was dispatched to Amir's aid, and they arrived after a few hours, finding him in his bed. Luckily, his injuries did not threaten his life at that point, but the resulting infection would spread rapidly if he was not taken care of. So they rushed him to another outpost with more people and a doctor. His leg had to be amputated to half his shin, but the damage did not stop there. Amir suffered from cracked ribs and intense trauma that required years of therapy to reach a manageable point. He continued to work for the same research company that hired him in the first place, but he was mostly relegated to logistics instead of actual research. Sometime in 2019, a hungry polar bear just surprisingly went to a Russian industrial city looking for food. The news made headlines throughout all of Russia and raised concern for the residents' and workers' safety. Scientists, however, have a different outlook on the news. Instead of raising concerns for the people's safety first, they were implying that this was a warning sign that climate change was going terrible and were more concerned about the polar bear's overall well-being. The city's residents and workers were terrified of having a polar bear on the loose that could potentially attack them at any time. However, the polar bear hadn't attacked anyone yet and was searching everywhere in the city for food. It can sometimes be seen crossing the road, which causes traffic, searching dumpsters for food, or just casually lying down in an open space to rest. The people eventually grew accustomed to having a polar bear with them and learned to live their lives with caution in case the polar bear became enraged or ended up harming the residents. The authorities also attempted to return the polar bear to its home by approaching it, but approaching it was already dangerous. Everything was normal until one accident suddenly happened, which immediately sparked the movement to remove the polar bear. Andre is a young adult working and living alone in the city. He's a waiter at a restaurant and has been working there for three and a half years. Despite being young, he already has an apartment of his own and even a car that he could use to navigate the city and go to the restaurant where he worked. Despite having a stable source of income, Andre felt lonely about living alone. He eventually became depressed and had to undergo therapy to help heal from everything he's been struggling through. During one of his therapy sessions, his therapist suggested getting a friendly companion, such as a dog. Andre thought this was a good idea, 
so he immediately got a female husky dog named Katya. Katya was a lifesaver for Andre. Ever since she became Andre's companion, Andre has felt happiness for the first time in many years and is taking good care of her. Katya has grown into a sweet and obedient dog, and Andre sometimes brings her to work, impressing the other staff and even customers with how behaved the dog is. When the news about the loose polar bear entering their city came out, Andre ensured that Katya was always inside his home and never went out. He feared the polar bear might see Katya as food and attack her. From that time on, Andre made sure that Katya was always safe. One time, Andre decided to take Katya to work again. He first placed Katya in the driver's seat before getting inside the vehicle. Then he realized that his car's engine had broken down since it wouldn't start properly. Disappointed, Andre got out of the car to inspect and fix it. He opens the hood of the car and starts checking the engine. While he was examining, Katya began to bark loud enough for the neighborhood to hear. Andre tries to shush Katya quietly while focusing on the machine, only for her bark to become louder with time. Andre becomes annoyed and slams the car's hood, only to see the loose polar bear right in front of him, staring at Katya barking inside the vehicle. Andre backs away slowly as he keeps eye contact with the bear, although it's evident that he's terrified. The polar bear slowly approached him as he backed away, with Katya struggling and wanting to get outside the vehicle to confront it. Andre signals Katya to calm down, but the dog won't stop barking and wanting to get outside. Katya then jumps out the car's window and begins confronting the polar bear from behind, causing the bear to feel agitated and eventually attack the dog. Andre screamed as he ran forward to save Katya, who the bear was viciously biting. He tried to push the bear off his dog, but got clawed on the torso, causing him to back away. He felt his torso bleeding from underneath his clothes, but this didn't stop him. Andre charges at the bear again, but this time the polar bear lets go of Katya and takes him down to the ground instead. A wounded and bloodied Katya slowly walked away from the scene, feeling weak after the attack. The polar bear growls as Andre screams for help, hoping someone from their neighborhood might come and rescue them. The animal kept biting his head and clawing his body, which caused him to cry out in pain while trying his best to defend himself. When all hope is gone for Andre, he suddenly hears a gunshot which startles the bear. It turns out it was the policeman living beside his house, carrying a rifle. He fires a warning shot to startle the bear and another one to scare the bear away. After the bear ran off from Andre, he called an ambulance to pick them up and reported the situation to the other authorities. After a couple of minutes, Andre was taken to a hospital, while Katya was taken to a veterinary clinic for her recovery. Miraculously, the two of them survived, despite Katya getting severe injuries. After the attack, the city officials decided to take matters more seriously and hunt the bear to get it back to the wild or euthanize it if things got worse and it attacked more people. The case with Andre and his dog Katya became a wake-up call for the residents to be more concerned for their safety and not get too accustomed to the loose polar bear. Eventually, the polar bear was then shot dead through a legal hunt just days after the officials ordered the search for it. Polar bears are simply the apex predators of the Arctic huge, predatory, and most especially dangerous. If they look cuddly and cute to you, think again, because this giant bear is two times the size of a Siberian tiger and would not hesitate to attack once it spots you in its territory. The fact that it will try to devour everything as long as it has meat and will always attack anything it sees, like a ruthless killer, makes it even more frightening. Surprisingly, polar bear attacks are rare, but with the worsening global warming and its effect on the Arctic, the polar bears are forced to find new habitats and end up in settlements with human civilization, thus resulting in an increase in attacks over time. In this polar bear attacks video, we'll feature three more terrifying polar bear attack stories from which survivors didn't expect to escape. Story 1 
Young adults Theodore, Asher, and Rocky are three college best friends who decided to camp near the shore of Kaktavik, the city where they live in Alaska. They're part of a 300 resident population of the village, which is famous for its cold weather and most significantly, polar bears. Polar bears are also considered regular residents of the village, and visitors from around the world visit the place annually to get a closer look at giant carnivorous animals. Theodore, Asher, and Rocky are so fond of polar bears that sometimes they can see one just right in front of their homes and not complain about it. The three gentlemen set up a campfire after setting up their sleeping bags. They find it peaceful and soothing to camp near the shore because of the cold temperature and the views of the icebergs situated in the waters far from the village. Everything was calm and peaceful after their campfire was now burning bright. Asher decided to sleep first as Theodore and Rocky were left sitting around the campfire. The two talked about their daily lives and college stuff when suddenly they heard a series of heavy thumps near them. Rocky asked if Theodore heard them too, which he said he did. The two of them were alarmed as the thumping sounds were getting closer and it might be a wild animal wanting one of them to fall prey to it. And within a split second, Asher just suddenly screamed as something was dragging him from his sleeping bag by his feet. When Rocky and Theodore stared at the creature, it was none other than a polar bear. Asher was screaming at the top of his lungs as the polar bear kept dragging him away from the camp. The bear suddenly stopped after a few seconds as it clawed Asher's legs, causing him to cry out painfully. Theodore and Rocky didn't waste time as they grabbed some wood from their campfire and made sure it caught fire to make a wooden torch before sprinting to where Asher and the polar bear were. When they got to Asher and the polar bear, the bear was about to claw Asher's head. When Rocky bravely swung the wooden torch, as Theodore did the same, causing the polar bear to stop attacking Asher and growl in agitation. The two continued to swing their torches and threaten the polar bear until it was scared away from Asher, who was severely wounded. When the polar bear got away, Theodore and Rocky carried their friend to the village premises to tell their fellow residents what had happened. There, Asher was taken to a health clinic for recovery, while the local hunters decided to hunt down the polar bear that terrified the three young adults. Story 2 Kvitoya is an island in the Svalbard archipelago and is widely known as the White Island. The island is located in the easternmost part of Norway and is the closest to the Russian Arctic possession. It is also the most remote island in Svalbard and is entirely covered by ice caps, which explains why it gained the name as the White Island of the said archipelago. Hank and his wife April are among the many tourists on a cruise from Spitsbergen to Kvitoya. The cruise service provides all the tourists with breathtaking views of the nearby Arctic and some animals such as whales, seals, and even polar bears. After the half-hour-long cruise, the tourists were dropped off at the coast of Kvitoya, where they would see a spectacular view of the massive Kvitoyjukulin ice cap in front of them. Hank, April, and the other 18 tourists were amazed by the scenery, so they took pictures and videos to remember their trip here. The island is also known for its large walrus population, which is why some tourists visit this majestic place. Some tourists were even wildlife photographers hoping to get a close shot of the terrifying polar bear or the enormous walrus. After viewing the ice cap, Hank and April decided to sit near the coast and have a little picnic as they were a bit tired from the trip. Their stay at Kvitoya would only last for three hours until they would be cruised back to Spitsbergen again. So they have to make the most of their visit here on this island. While eating their sandwiches, they suddenly heard the tourists screaming from a distance. The couple thought they were shouting because of excitement, so they didn't mind it and tried to enjoy their time together. In a split second, a mid-sized polar bear swiftly grabs April by her right leg and drags her across the coast. Hank, surprised yet terrified, immediately stood up from where he was sitting and chased the polar bear who was carrying his wife. April screamed for help as the polar bear kept dragging her away from the coast. She could also feel the polar bear's clawed paws piercing her leg already. Hank was screaming as he kept chasing the polar bear in April until some authorities came in, honking their air horns loudly to scare the polar bear away from its victim. The polar bear, now about to bite through April's leg, 
was startled as it heard the honking of the air horns. As the authorities kept scaring the polar bear away, the animal became agitated and tried to attack the officers instead, leaving April unconscious and wounded. After a few tries of trying to attack one of the authorities, the polar bear decided to go to the coast. Hank, the authorities, and the tourists were shocked by the sudden attack, as April was still unconscious and needed to be taken to a hospital for her recovery. After the gruesome incident, the Kvitoya authorities decided to take better caution and improve their measures regarding the tours to, to prevent such incidents in the future. Story 3 The polar bear exhibit in a zoo in Detroit is a top attraction among families, tourists, students, and most importantly, children. Inside the polar bear exhibit is a two-year-old adolescent polar bear named Benny born and raised in captivity. The bear is exclusively handled by zoo handlers Troy and Madison, who've been there since its birth. Today will be Benny's third birthday, and the zoo will conduct a special live feeding event to celebrate Benny's milestone. The zoo prepared a special cake made literally out of fish to be given by none other than Troy and Madison. At the beginning of the event, many people have been waiting outside Benny's enclosure for Troy and Madison to enter. After a few minutes, the two handlers entered the chamber, with Madison holding the fish cake. Then they sang the happy birthday song to Benny as the bear approached the two of them and sat beside them, staring at the fish cake. The people surrounding the enclosure sang along with Troy and Madison as they blew out the candle on top of the fish cake and removed it so Benny could eat it. Troy begins to pat Benny's head for being a good bear since he was born, as Madison is giving the fish cake already to the bear. Everything was going fine when, unfortunately, Benny began to growl at Madison, causing her to flinch and take a few steps back away from the bear. Troy tried to pat Benny's head to calm him down, but the bear suddenly bit his hand. Troy screamed as Madison and the visitors were shocked by Benny biting Troy's hand. Madison went over to Benny to try and stop him from biting Troy's hand, but Benny won't let it go out of its mouth. Troy could already feel Benny's teeth penetrating his skin, as Madison tried to hold Benny back and stop it from biting Troy's hand even more. Benny unexpectedly let go of Troy's hand, but he had already gone wild before the two handlers knew it. Benny started to growl and grabbed the fish cake that Madison had dropped and threw away in its pool's enclosure before roaring again and tackling Madison down to the ground. This time, other zoo authorities had decided to enter the enclosure to stop and neutralize Benny, which was immediately successful, with Troy and Madison accumulating injuries. After the incident, Benny was moved into a much more secure enclosure as Troy and Madison would recover first before deciding if they would want to handle Benny again after the incident. The polar bear exhibit in that zoo was closed and the authorities aren't sure when to open it again. The tragic story of a mother and her little kid being mauled to death by a polar bear in an Alaskan village has stirred widespread media coverage. However, there was more bad news than that. The polar bear was still on the loose in other possible nearby towns. The authorities already issued a wide hunt to take the bear down, which was accepted by many hunters. However, those hunters did not find the bear since they searched in one area. Bear hunters Jordy and Sullivan were disturbed by the news of the polar bear still on the loose after killing two people. Eventually, the two accepted the challenge of hunting for the bear, but they went to a different town near where the mother and child died from the attack. Jordy and Sullivan took themselves to Utkyagvik, an Alaskan city close to the Arctic coast. The two of them suspected that the polar bear might blend itself with the number of polar bears there, so they decided to hunt for it. As they arrived at Utkyagvik, they were accommodated by a resident named Anchor. Anchor tells Jordy and Sullivan that the recent news about the loose polar bear has terrified the residents, and they were seldom seen going outside due to the threat. With this, the two became more determined to hunt for the bear immediately. As they went inside their designated cabin within the city, the two of them prepared the equipment needed for the hunt. Jordy and Sullivan both prepared their hunting rifles as they also prepared the things they needed to take DNA samples of the bear that they'll kill 
and hand it over to the authorities to confirm if it was the one who killed the mother and child. After preparing all the needed stuff, the two rested and stored all their strength and energy for tomorrow's important hunt. The next day, Jordy and Sullivan woke up as early as possible and prepared all their equipment for the hunt they'll be doing today. Sullivan is quite pessimistic about finding the bear, but Jordy is determined and tells them that they are doing it for the recognition and the safety of others. As a kind-hearted citizen, Sullivan quickly agrees with Jordy as they secure all their stuff and meet up with Anchor outside their cabin. Anchor then took the two hunters to the coast, where polar bears usually go when they want to hunt for fish to eat. The three started searching around the area when they encountered a polar bear with a dirty coat. Jordy examined the bear from head to toe and asked Sullivan about his thoughts. Sullivan says they needed to get closer to the bear so he could also analyze its appearance and not mistake it for another who hasn't killed anyone. The three slowly approached the bear, but unfortunately the bear heard their footsteps and stared at them. They halted while slowly grabbing their hunting rifles. As the bear growled and charged at Jordy in a split second, Jordy was about to fire a shot when the polar bear jumped at him and pinned him down to the ground. Indeed, this was the polar bear who took the lives of two people. The polar bear began to bite Jordy's head and lower jaw, causing it to bleed. Jordy groaned in intense pain as the bear clawed his torso and arms. Sullivan panicked as he struggled to get perfect aim on the bear, while Anchor called on the other residents for help. Sullivan then screamed at the bear, getting its attention. When the bear was about to charge at him, he shot at the polar bear's head, causing it to collapse lifelessly on the ground. As Anchor and the other residents arrived, the polar bear was dead, and they just had to take the bloody Geordie to a hospital. Exhausted, Sullivan took blood and footprint samples from the bear, even if it was evident that it was the one who killed the mother and the child. After Geordie was taken to the hospital, Sullivan submitted the samples to the authorities, and they confirmed that it was indeed the same polar bear who terrorized the lives of two people in a town. They eventually recognized Jordy and Sullivan's efforts in hunting and killing the bear for the safety of others. The story for today's video takes us to Canada's largest, coldest, and northernmost region, Nunavut, which is its tundra territory with a cold, remote, and craggy environment, home to 28,000 Inuit people. Many tourists are fascinated by the weather conditions and the locals' way of living here. It gained fame due to its frigid temperatures and is a popular place to catch a glimpse of the northern lights and spot unique animals such as narwhals, seals, walruses, beluga whales, and the most anticipated and feared of them all, the ferocious polar bear. People who want to view a polar bear up close and in the wild frequently travel to Nunavut. Polar bears are considered residents of this place as they can freely roam in areas where they want to. However, they are hunted down by Nunavut hunters in case they would begin to attack people, as countless cases of polar bear attacks within this territory have been recorded ever since. Given that polar bears are the strongest, most powerful, and most aggressive of all bear species, there's no surprise that they would bring terror to the residents and even tourists of Nunavut. In this video, we'll feature a horrifying true story of a woman who got attacked by a polar bear while studying beluga whales in Pond Inlet, an Inuit hamlet within Nunavut. A wildlife researcher named Aldina Moore was sent to Nunavut with 12 other researchers to study beluga whales, the sea canaries of the ocean. Since she knew about them, Aldina had been deeply interested in learning about beluga whales and would grab any chance to see and check them out up close. Aldina was mesmerized by the sight of the surroundings as Yotimo and Hanta showed them some beautiful views along their motorboat ride. Aldina took countless photographs of the animals and sights she and the other researchers saw while sailing to their campsite. Upon arriving at their campsite near the coast, Yotimo and Hanta helped Adina and the researchers set up their camp. There were individual sleeping bags for all researchers, a huge research tent, and a table to eat, and many boxes full of food, supplies, and gear. 
and other essentials needed for their research expedition to study beluga whales. After doing all the work in setting up their camp, Aldina decided they should all take a rest before setting up the net they'll be using to catch a beluga whale. Once they've finally seen one, they will only take intimate photographs of its body, take blood samples, examine its behavior, and possibly record clips of its sound. After half an hour, they will release the whale with no harm inflicted. Aldina went to Yotimo and Hanta to ask about the location's conditions and whether or not it caused any hazards while resting. Hanta told Adina that there were also tourists. They led to the camp and got home safely in no time. After hearing those, Aldina was convinced that the place was completely safe. However, Yotimo warned her immediately of polar bears. Polar bears are native to these areas, Yotimo began as he spoke. Our tourists might get home alive and safe, but they also got home scared and terrified because they saw a polar bear, he added. Confused, yet filled with curiosity, Aldina began to ask Yotimo some questions. Do you have any idea what happened to those tourists? Why are they so terrified of polar bears? What did the polar bears do to them? She asked. Yotimo sighed as he pointed out a spot at a distance and told Adina to look at it. He told Adina that it was where polar bears usually go and where tourists usually saw them at some point. Adina was quite surprised at how close the spot was to their camp. Hanta assured Aldina that the polar bears go to that spot to cool down or eat food they gathered from hunting in other parts of the fjord. As long as Aldina and the other researchers won't do something that may threaten or provoke them, they'll be fine. And again, Aldina was convinced that everyone would be safe if she stuck to what Yotimo and Hanta had said. After her conversation with the two Inuits, she told the others they should start setting up the particular net they made to catch one beluga whale. Another researcher named Evan decided to carry out the plan of getting the net into the water. Together with four other male researchers, they set up the trap before steering it into the water to drop it. Once the net had been dropped, Aldina told the other researchers that they should monitor it for 24 hours a day. And to do this, they should have rotating shifts every three to four hours. The other researchers agreed as they started watching the net for signs of a beluga whale. Aldina assigned herself to do the afternoon shift, to which most researchers agreed. She took a quick nap until one of the researchers woke her up when it was finally her turn to watch the net. She sat down on a portable chair with two other researchers named Rita and Nicholas and began their shift. While watching, the three of them casually talked about polar bears instead of beluga whales. The two were curious about how big a polar bear could get while Aldina was slightly disturbed by the thought of seeing a huge predator up close. She told the other two that polar bears are highly aggressive and will not hesitate to kill. After the small talk, Aldina excused herself to go to a nearby spot as she saw two seals going to the coast. She quickly grabbed her camera and took pictures of the seals. It was a rare moment to see seals up close, and Aldina would never miss a chance to document them. Suddenly, Aldina felt something strange in her surroundings. She felt like something had been following her the entire time she's documenting the seals at the coast. She tried to look around and roam around the place to find out if something was following her or if it was just her intuition. Aldina spotted what she was trying to avoid, a polar bear. She couldn't determine if the bear was near or far from her, but she could only assume that the bear was meters away from her. Scared but still fascinated, Aldina slowly tried to take a picture of the bear when it suddenly started to walk towards her. Terrified, Aldina freaked out and decided to run for the camp, but it was too late. As soon as she started running was the moment the bear ran swiftly and caught her in its huge paws in no time. She had no idea that polar bears are this fast and quick when capturing their prey. Aldina began to scream as the polar bear immediately pinned her down to the ground and scratched her torso, causing excruciating pain. She tried squirming her body to escape from the huge animal, but it only caused her to end up lying on her back, giving more access to the polar bear to leave scratches and wounds on her body. Aldina once again screamed for help. The other researchers heard her this time and decided to rush to her. As the researchers were running to help her, the polar bear continued to claw Aldina's back as she was protecting her nape from being scratched despite the pain she's been feeling. 
After clawing at her for a while, the polar bear stopped and jumped on her body. It then stomped on her several times. When the researchers arrived at the scene, Evan brought out a rifle that he was given and aimed a shot at the polar bear. Due to the quick movements of the polar bear, it missed, but the rifle's sound was so loud that it immediately startled the animal. When Evan noticed this, he fired another shot beside the polar bear, which made it run away from them instantly, leaving Aldina conscious and wounded. They immediately called a plane to come and pick them up to take Aldina to Ikalau, the only city within Nunavut, as it has a medical facility. There, Aldina received more than 400 stitches for her wounds and was provided with intense treatment to recover from her severe injuries from the polar bear attack. The research expedition that Aldina's team had been doing was canceled due to what happened. After the incident, Nunavut hunters came together at the place to hunt for the polar bear that attacked Aldina, so it won't harm any more tourists. Luckily, Aldina made it out alive and was on her way to recovery. Our final story takes us back to the frigid wastes of Greenland, where researcher Henrik Olsen found himself being chased by certain death for miles. Henrik was conducting research on the southern coastline of Greenland on October 23, 1987, a routine operation performed monthly. Having been at a southern supply post for the better half of a week, he had decided to prepare his sleigh and dogs for the grueling journey. He packed his supplies on the back of the sleigh and prepped his dogs. Henrik began the trek north to Station Nord, where his team was waiting. The six dogs strapped to the sleigh started at a slow pace but quickly sped up, and soon Henrik was running across the frozen waste back home. He had been traveling for a few hours when he noticed that the movement of the dogs was becoming irregular, like they were steering on their own. This usually never happened, so Henrik knew that something was wrong. Just as these thoughts crossed his mind, he noticed that the light snowfall around them began to become heavier, meaning a storm was closing in. He made the dogs pick up the pace while there was still visibility to guide them back, and they sped forward. A few miles after this moment, the dogs returned to their irregular running patterns, which annoyed Henrik, but there was nothing to do about it. As he was thinking about the best thing to do, horror struck him as a massive paw slashed through the storm, followed by a loud roar, missing Henrik by a hair's breadth. His hands gripped the handles of the sleigh as he spun his head around to see the giant polar bear charging behind them. The beast was not giving up, so Henrik made the dogs speed up. They were panicked, but they understood his command. The wind stung Henrik's face as his beard frosted over, and his heartbeat raced faster than ever. Before long, Henrik could no longer see the bear behind them. Nonetheless, he did not let the dogs slow down lest the bear catch up so they continued at max pace. After a few more miles, Henrik noticed they were getting closer to Station Nord and rejoiced at the idea of safety and warmth. The station was within his line of sight, but to his dismay, so was the bear. A few dozen yards behind the sleigh, the bear was still chasing after them with no sign of letting up. Henrik's dogs were starting to get tired at the worst possible moment and Henrik could see the bear getting closer and closer. Based on his report, there was no chance of him and his dog surviving if one of Henrik's colleagues hadn't noticed them from one of the buildings at the station. The colleague called an alarm, and a few ran in Henrik's direction, rifles in hand. They stood their ground, aimed, and fired a few shots that flew past Henrik and directly into the bear, which made it stop in place immediately. Panting and limping, Henrik's dogs ran into one of the silos while Henrik quickly shut the door and sprinted to the nearest building along with his colleagues. They stacked on one of the windows and watched the bear walk around near the station before turning around and blending into the storm. Those dogs lived like kings for the next week and Henrik remained forever grateful for their bravery and loyalty. Henrik habitually paid more attention to the weather forecast from that point on. Our first story is set on the Norwegian island of Svalbard, also known as Spitsbergen, and concerns the tragic demise of Jana Kutya, a Ukrainian geologist working with a team of researchers on the island in 1978. 
Yana was supposed to only be on the island for two weeks, but due to complications with transport and financing, she and her team had to remain on the island for an entire month. Their food consisted of cans of frozen gruel and the occasional treat of sweets. They sometimes visited nearby towns for food and supplies, but that was once in a blue moon. Due to the isolation and the cold, tensions were rising within the group, and they were itching to go home. One particularly harsh argument fragmented them. In what was supposed to be a five-man trip to examine sediment on the southern coast of the upper archipelago of the island, turned into a two-person trip consisting of Yana and her colleague Franz. The two were friends from college, and they often conducted research together to further their knowledge of their field and complete their education. As a matter of happenstance, the two were drafted for the same expedition to Svalbard. It took them two hours to make the trip to the southern coast as there was a lack of concise roads, and the way there was treacherous. They started their journey in the early morning, so they would return in time by the end of the day. As they got to their location via snowmobile, the pair unpacked their things and set up a small camp for the time being, as they needed to eat and prepare their equipment. It took them not but 20 minutes to set everything up, and half the time to eat, so they were free to explore and analyze what they needed. Yana always told Franz that sediment was the most uninteresting thing they could study, and it was true. They were terribly bored the entire time, and Franz reported feeling awkward occasionally, as if they were being watched. He just brushed it off as the weeks of their trip were getting to him. They continued working for the better part of three hours before they decided it was enough and that they could start the trip back to the research base. It took them longer to pack their things than unpack them as they were tired from work. After 30 minutes of packing, the pair was finally ready to return. Nothing was out of the ordinary for the first 20 minutes of the trip until they reached a jutting of rocks that they had to get around. The snow started falling, and it looked like a storm was mounting, so they accelerated. In their haste, they failed to notice the lumbering shape lurking behind the rocks, and the speed it was running at the moment. Franz felt a tremendous force knock into his right side, which toppled him, Yana, and the snowmobile. He could not see anything from the snow in his eyes, but when he cleared his vision, he could only see the snowmobile upright and still running. However, Yana was nowhere to be found. He yelled out her name, but there was no response. The storm was still picking up, and he knew they both ran the risk of getting hypothermia. Yana even more so if she was knocked out by whatever slammed into them. He unhooked the rifle from their snowmobile and walked around the area, carefully keeping the vehicle in his sights so he would not lose it. Staying on foot during a storm like that was akin to signing your death warrant. After a few minutes, Franz could hear cries muffled by the furious wind around him and pushed forward only to see something he would never forget. Yana was lying on her stomach, facing him with a massive polar bear pressing down. It sank its teeth into Yana's shoulder and pulled, each movement squeezing another scream from its victim. Yana saw Franz and screamed for help, and Franz reacted immediately. He was not accustomed to shooting a rifle, but had to act. He took his stance, shouldered the butt of the weapon, took aim, and pulled the trigger. The gun was jammed. All of the defiant hope in Franz's heart at that moment was washed away by the hopeless click of the useless firearm. His hands tremored, and he lowered the gun. Yana kept screaming but Franz knew he could do nothing against a full-grown polar bear, so he slowly backed away into the snowfall, back toward the snowmobile. As he made his way there, Yana's screams slowly got quieter, and they were cut off suddenly. At that moment, Franz knew his colleague's life was snuffed out. In somber silence, he mounted the vehicle and began his journey back to the research station. It took him twice as long to get there due to the storm and poor visibility, but he had just enough gas left. When he got there, he met with the rest of the group in the main building. They were playing cards. When one of them noticed Franz, they made a sarcastic remark about Yana being late as usual, but
but their friendly tone shifted when they saw the ghastly expression on Franz's face. After much questioning about where Yana was, Franz broke down in the sobs and fell to the floor. He explained what had happened, and the group was in utter shock. They knew that the storm was too strong to go out then, so they resolved to leave the base in the morning to look for Yana. The following morning, the four of them set out on two snowmobiles to look for their colleague. After the standard two hours, they arrived at the site of the attack, but Yana was nowhere to be found. As they looked around more, they could see something dark contrasting the whiteness of the snow in the distance. Investigating closer, they could see what it was. Clothes. Ragged scraps of clothes were piled on one spot, surrounded by a wide splatter of blood. Franz moved forward to examine it, and as he pulled the fabric up, he fell back, reeling onto the ground. He screamed as he threw up, and all he could manage to do was point in the general direction of the clothes. The rest of the group has a similar reaction. Under the clothes was the frozen hollow husk of Yana's body, picked apart and left by the bear. They used a tarp they brought along to wrap the remains in and took them back to the base out of respect for their colleague. The authorities were called and all of the regular measures were taken to make sure that Yana's remains would be sent back to Ukraine to her family. The rest of the group was told that they would still have to finish their assignment despite the circumstances, which infuriated them. They called the office to collectively resign from their positions and organized a flight with the funds they had left over. Although the group knew how dangerous polar bears were, they did not blame Franz for not saving Yana. Franz could never forgive himself for what happened. He resigned from geology and took up a simple accounting job in his hometown. Out of all bear species, polar bears are considered one of the most aggressive and dangerous, followed by the grizzly bear. Despite being very dangerous, they are also fascinating marine mammals inhabiting the Arctic. However, they're facing one big problem that can also affect us humans, climate change. And now people, especially animal advocates, are trying their best to take certain measures to conserve the majestic species of polar bears. Despite their critical situation regarding climate change, we can't deny the fact that polar bear attacks are also on the rise, as they have been already finding new places to inhabit and eventually would mostly end up in residential places with people living in there or have been in contact with people who were just trying to study how the current global situation affects them. In this video, we compiled the most bone-chilling and terrifying polar bear stories to date. Laura Stone had always been drawn to the allure of the Earth's rocky landscapes. As a geologist, she spent her days traversing rugged terrains, studying the secrets held within the layers of stone. Svalbard, a Norwegian archipelago nestled in the Arctic Ocean, had become her latest destination for exploration. The remote town where Laura resided was known for its breathtaking polar bear population. These majestic creatures roam the icy tundra, often visible from afar. Fascinated by their resilience and their adaptability, Laura had spent countless hours observing them in their natural habitat. However, one fateful day, her admiration for these creatures is shattered by a brutal turn of events. It was a crisp morning, and Laura set out on her routine trek, equipped with her tools and backpack filled with provisions. The sun's rays kissed the vast expanse of snow, casting an ethereal glow on the icy landscape. Laura was absorbed in her thoughts, pondering the hidden stories waiting to be unearthed beneath the surface. Unbeknownst to Laura, a young polar bear had strayed from its usual path and found itself venturing closer to the town. The bear, curious yet inexperienced, stumbled upon the scent of human presence. Intrigued, it followed the aroma until it caught sight of Laura. A sudden chill ran down her spine as Laura immersed herself in her work. She glanced around, and her heart skipped a beat as she locked eyes with the massive white beast. Fear gripped her as she realized she was face to face with a young polar bear, its muscles tense 
and curiosity morphing into aggression. Instinct took over and Laura attempted to slowly back away, careful not to provoke the animal. But her movements were met with a growl, a warning sign that the bear was not ready to relinquish its newfound territory. Panic surged through her veins as she realized the severity of her predicament. Laura's knees began to tremble as the polar bear got closer while she slowly moved away from it. The bear couldn't contain itself, and within a moment it growled before charging toward the terrified geologist. The bear easily took Laura down to the ground, despite it not being in its adult size yet. However, it was surprisingly heavy that she felt her whole body being squeezed tight by pressure as soon as the bear got on top of her and started to attack her by scratching her everywhere, from her head down to her torso with its sharp claws. Laura screamed in excruciating pain as she tried to fight the polar bear with her own two hands, but failed. The bear showed no signs of stopping as it kept mauling Laura while the geologist desperately screamed for help with blood all over her body and face. She knew she would die if no one could save her from the animal. Just as despair began to cloud Laura's mind, a nearby resident named Odin appeared on the scene. Odin was an experienced hunter and had developed a deep understanding of the Arctic wildlife. Hearing the commotion, he rushed to assess the situation and devise a plan to save Laura from the clutches of the polar bear. Odin recognized the aggression in the young bear's eyes and knew that swift action was necessary. With the expertise of a seasoned hunter, he grabbed a flare gun from his backpack and fired it into the sky. The loud sound reverberated through the air, startling the polar bear momentarily. The bear stopped attacking Laura, allowing her to slowly crawl away from the animal despite her injuries and wounds. Taking advantage of the bear's momentary confusion, Odin positioned himself between Laura and the animal, attempting to create a barrier. He shouted a forceful command, piercing through the Arctic silence. The bear hesitated, uncertain of how to react. Odin knew that time was of the essence. He mustered all his courage and unleashed a primal roar, asserting his dominance over the young bear. The polar bear, overwhelmed by the intensity of the situation, turned and retreated into the vast snowy landscape, disappearing from sight. Laura, shaken and injured but alive, tried to stand up but apparently collapsed to the ground, her body trembling with a mixture of relief, shock, and pain. Odin rushed to her side, offering a steady hand and a reassuring presence. He wrapped her in warm blankets, providing comfort against the biting cold. Together they returned to the town's safety to give Laura first aid for her injuries before taking her to a nearby hospital. News of Laura's encounter with the polar bear spread like wildfire through the tight-knit community. Gratitude filled the townspeople's hearts as they celebrated Odin's selfless bravery and unwavering commitment to their fellow residents' well-being. In the aftermath of the incident, Laura's passion for geology remained unshaken. However, newfound respect and caution accompanied her future endeavors, which made her even more alert and aware of the surroundings if she had some exploring to do again. The attack she experienced was traumatizing, but it made her stronger as each day passed. People use a handy rhyme when it comes to bears. If it's brown, lie down. If it's black, fight back. If it's white, good night. The third one seems a bit disheartening because polar bears are one of the only predators that actively hunt humans, so they are the most dangerous. Polar bears are the most giant bear, capable of reaching 1,600 pounds and over 9 feet in height. They are all muscle, all teeth, and no mercy. We have five stories about unlucky individuals that have crossed paths with polar bears and live to tell their tales. Story 1 Our first story takes place on the frozen island of Svalbard, Norway. This is one of the northernmost inhabited places in the world, with a population of just 2,642, and it boasts rugged, icy terrain that is harsh and unforgiving. 
the perfect home for polar bears. American tourists Jill and Kenny Cormack decided they wanted to switch out their annual tropical destinations for something a bit calmer and more relaxed, so they booked a trip to Svalbard and arrived on the island on September 18, 2014. The pair decided they just wanted to relax and partake in some of the activities you can check out in Svalbard. From visiting ice caves and abandoned mines, to dog sledding and ATV safaris. However, one of the things that really interested them was the national parks and the opportunity to camp in the frigid wilderness in absolute silence. On the fourth day of the pair's visit, they decided to camp in Spitsbergen National Park and maybe do some fishing. They couldn't go alone, so they partnered with a guide and his friend, taking a large truck to their destination. When they arrived at the small cabin in the woods, Jill and Kenny decided to take a walk around to take in some of the nature while the two men unpacked their things. It was one of the most beautiful things Jill had ever seen, and she told her husband that fact. They decided to spend three days in the park, after which they would return to their hotel and close out their stay. No better way to wrap things up. When they returned to the cabin, the pair saw that the guide and his friend had quickly unpacked everything and were getting dinner started. The following night, the four sat around the cabin with Jill and Kenny embracing as the two men sang traditional Norwegian songs. The pair later went out of the cabin to take a short walk and to have a nightcap, eventually making it about 30 feet from the place before falling into a loving embrace. They were as quiet as possible to not disturb the men in the cabin. It didn't last long as Kenny noticed movement from the rock he was leaning on and the hairs on his neck stood up as he realized they were not leaning on a rock at all. It was a sleeping polar bear. Everything happened quickly, and the pair reported that their memory of the incident was hazy since they were under the influence. However, their guide had a more apparent memory, and he said that the pair had gone out for five minutes. He heard a scream from Jill, and when he got to the door, he got knocked aside as the pair rushed into the small cabin, bare at their heels. The guide acted quickly and slammed the door shut, only for the giant bear to knock it back open while he pushed with all he had. He called for Kenny to help him move it, and the young man jumped. The pressure on the door was immense. This wasn't even a full-grown polar bear. His friend rushed down the steps, shotgun in hand. He stuck the gun's barrel into the door's opening and pulled the trigger. The guide noticed the pressure on the door get considerably lighter as the bear made a painful grunt and retreated into the wood. Kenny and the tour guide quickly put a metal latch on the door and sat on the floor, breathing heavily. They ended up only staying until the morning, starting for their hotel at 6 a.m. Based on Jill's report, she could have sworn that she saw movement near the cabin as they were pulling off in the truck. Kate had always been adventurous, seeking unique and daring travel experiences. This time, his sights were set on the enchanting wilderness of Longyearbyen, a small town in the Svalbard archipelago known for its stunning landscapes and the possibility of encountering majestic polar bears. Little did he know that his journey would take an unexpected turn, testing his resilience and revealing the strength of human compassion. With his faithful companion Remy, a loyal and intelligent dog, Cade set up camp near the frozen fjords, eagerly anticipating the wonders that awaited him. Longyearbyen was renowned for its polar bear population, but Cade had taken all the necessary precautions. He had acquired a permit and attended an extensive safety briefing, equipping himself with bear spray and a shotgun, ensuring he was prepared for any encounters that may come his way. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a surreal glow over the icy landscape, Cade settled into his tent, finding solace in the silence that enveloped him. Remy curled up at his side, ever watchful and alert. Little did they know that danger lurked just beyond their canvas shelter. A deep rumble startled Cade from his slumber in the early morning hours. He unzipped the tent, peering into the darkness. Then he caught a glimpse of a polar bear its massive form silhouetted against the moonlit snow. Fear gripped him 
and his heart raced as he realized he was facing a life-or-death situation. Instinctively, Cade reached for his bear spray, fumbling with it in his nervousness. The polar bear charged, its thunderous footsteps shaking the ground beneath them. Before he could react, the bear swiped at him with its razor-sharp claws, sending Cade sprawling backward, his body racked with pain. Remy, sensing his companion's distress, sprang into action. With unwavering bravery, he lunged at the polar bear, barking ferociously and distracting the beast long enough for Cade to regain his footing. The polar bear turned its attention to Remy, swatting at him with a massive paw. The dog yelped in pain, but refused to back down. Just as all hope seemed lost, a figure emerged from the shadows. It was Briggs, another tourist who had been camping nearby. Witnessing the horrifying scene, Briggs knew he had to act swiftly. With adrenaline coursing through his veins, he grabbed a flare gun from his backpack and fired it into the air, creating a burst of bright light and loud sound. The polar bear, momentarily stunned by the unexpected disturbance, hesitated momentarily. Briggs seized the opportunity, grabbing Cade and Remy, and together they sprinted toward safety. They raced toward Briggs's camp, seeking refuge in his sturdier shelter as the bear pursued them, its primal instincts driving it forward. Locked inside the makeshift fortress, they watched in awe and fear as the polar bear circled their camp, its mighty presence a constant reminder of the peril they had narrowly escaped. Briggs, skilled in survival techniques, fortified the camp, ensuring their safety until the authorities could be alerted. Days later, Cade, Remy, and Briggs sat together, recounting their harrowing ordeal. Cade was eternally grateful for the heroism and quick thinking of Briggs, without whom he may not have survived the brutal mauling. They formed a bond forged through adversity, their lives forever intertwined by the shared experience. Moving on, we'll now talk about what happens in the frigid Alaskan wilderness, where the only law is the law of nature, and nature shows no mercy. Our next story is about Margaret Brooks, a wildlife researcher who found herself between a bear and a hard place on December 18, 1982. Margaret's job was monitoring the migratory patterns of birds and other wildlife near a supply outpost south of Otkasuk. Her day started like any other, where she began her daily journal and set out to other outposts to monitor her findings. Although the job was harsh and she worked in the wilds most of the time, Margaret found joy and satisfaction in her career as a nature lover. Using a small buggy, Margaret made her way to another supply outpost approximately one hour from the one she started at. She needed to restock her supplies so she would spend one night at the outpost and return in the morning. This was a routine, as Margaret has been in this line of work for nearly 12 years, so she expected everything to go swimmingly. When she arrived at the outpost early in the morning, she opened the door and headed inside. The inside of the outpost was the same as your average cabin, albeit with a cellar with a good amount of supplies that anyone could stop and take. However, other people in these remote regions were relatively rare, and tourists were almost unheard of, so supplies were always abundant. After retrieving what she needed, Margaret returned to the cabin and set up her things after building a fire in the small furnace in the corner of the room. It was not a large cabin, so she only needed a small fire. While making the final rounds around the cabin, Margaret noticed noises and movement coming from outside but thought nothing of it. She soon went to sleep. A few hours later, Margaret woke to hear the same sounds she heard earlier, only this time they were louder. She got up from her bunk, grabbed a coat, put her boots on, and checked the windows. She recalled that although there was nothing outside, the cellar door was left unlocked, and the odors from there might have attracted animals. Treading carefully, she tiptoed around the side of the cabin and slowly opened the door to the storage cellar. It was empty. The supplies were there, but there was no sign of anything being in there. She walked in and examined the shelves further, stepping behind one. Indeed, nothing had been taken. 
Margaret felt a sense of unease as she looked at the shelves, which was justified as the moonlight breaking through the door frame was snuffed out by a large shape stepping in. Margaret looked at the enormous polar bear as it sauntered its way into the storeroom, likely looking for food. She thought quickly, ducking down behind the shelves as the bear lunged forward and grunted loudly. It knocked some shelves over and left Margaret behind two rows of shelves nearly smothered in cans and bags. The beast growled as it attempted to push through the narrow opening in the shelves, but it made no progress. Panicking at this point, Margaret felt around for anything that could help her. In a moment, not unlike an act of God, her hand found something in the dark. It resembled a can of deodorant, but Margaret saw a funnel-like protrusion coming from the top and realized it was an air horn. She pressed the release and the booming sound echoed through the cellar, causing the bear to stagger back and run outside. Although the immediate threat was gone, Margaret knew she had to act quickly, so she squeezed through the opening in the shelves and broke into a dead sprint toward the exit. She made it out, but the bear was still in the vicinity, so she ran to the cabin door, flung herself inside, and threw the large latch on. The bear stomped on the deck, but did not attempt to get in. Margaret scuffled into the corner and passed out from the shock of the experience. She woke up in the morning and promptly packed her things and the supplies she had gathered the previous night. She left the cabin as it was, as she could not bear to be there a second longer. It's the most beautiful time of the year, especially for a zoo in California. On Christmas Day, their female polar bear, Burnell, gave birth to two adorable cubs named Cuddles and Snow. Cuddles is a male polar bear cub, while Snow is female. The zoo's management and staff were pleased with Cuddles and Snow's arrival. Thus, they assigned two handlers to care for them, Ray and Megan. The birth of Cuddles and Snow has brought joy to the management, staff, and the zoo's visitors. Ever since they were born, the visitors to the zoo have doubled in numbers, and children are so happy to see baby cubs as close as they possibly can. Ray and Megan were also satisfied with their job, considering that the management entrusted them with caring for the adorable polar bear cubs. Before Ray and Megan could enter Burnell, Cuddles, and Snow's enclosure, Burnell was secured in a cage inside the chamber so the handlers could carefully check on the polar bear cubs. Ray and Megan played with Cuddles and Snow while the visitors happily watched them. The two handlers checked and played with the two cubs almost daily. This is done to make sure that the cubs receive enough attention, food, and care, since Burnell has been seen to have stress after giving birth to the cubs. Among the two handlers, Megan was the most affectionate with the cubs, since she tended to kiss and cuddle with them, while Ray played roughly with them to match their youthful energy. One day, Ray and Megan were told to check Cuddles and Snow's health since they had been showing signs of an illness. The two handlers immediately rushed to the enclosure and waited for another handler's signal that indicated Burnell had been secured in the cage. When Ray and Megan entered the chamber, they greeted Cuddles and Snow quickly. Cuddles was in good condition, and he wanted to play with Ray, while Snow was a bit lazy. Megan carried little Snow into her arms to check the bear much further. Suddenly, things took a wrong turn in the most unexpected way possible. Suddenly, the sound of the cage breaking is heard and echoing around the enclosure, startling Ray and Megan. And within a few seconds, Burnell broke free from the cage and charged toward Megan, who was holding snow. The cage was not fully shut and secured, which caused Burnell to escape. Megan immediately places snow on the floor and attempts to run, but it was too late. Burnell pounces on her and tackles her down to the enclosure's floor, putting all her weight on Megan. Megan struggled to breathe as she tried to fight Burnell by reaching for its eyes. However, Burnell becomes more enraged and bites Megan's shoulder, causing her to cry. Ray was panicking and terrified as he decided to call the zoo's lethal restraint team to neutralize Burnell and get the cubs to safety. Burnell was growling, biting, and scratching all over Megan's face and body when the lethal restraint team came inside the enclosure carrying rubber bullet guns. 
They immediately fired at Burnell with rubber bullets to neutralize her and get her off Megan. When they finally calmed Burnell, Ray rescued Megan as the other members of the lethal restraint team carried cuddles in snow and transferred them to a temporary cage. Megan was then taken to the nearest hospital. Her injuries and wounds were severe, but luckily she survived. Cuddles and Snow were in another enclosure for extensive care, as they could pass away without proper care from their mother or the other handlers. Greenland has one of the world's most preserved and beautiful nature ranges, despite its freezing and unforgiving climate. It houses a wide array of animal species, from musk oxen to hooded seals to the ferocious polar bear which is the subject of our next story. This incident transpired on August 18, 1998, on a small island south of Upernavik, Greenland. Commercial fisherman Ingvar Nielsen was sailing his vessel near Upernavik before making an emergency stop on one of the smaller islands for repairs. Ingvar had been fishing for the better part of a decade and knew that these stops never last long, so he rested easy. However, when he realized that his crew was taking a long time to complete the repair, he decided to look at the matter himself. He reported feeling annoyed that a trivial task was not being done correctly. Ingvar made his way to the main deck, where he saw a few of his crew members tinkering with one of the rudders on the back side of the ship and made his way down. The walk to the dock was short and brisk. Upon further examination, he concluded that the issue was more complicated than at first glance so he started the repairs himself. About five minutes went by when he felt a hand grip his shoulder, followed by the urgent whispering of his crew members. After turning around, Ingvar's blood froze as he realized his crew was being stared down by a massive polar bear. The beast took an aggressive stance and stood watching the team, waiting for someone to move. Eventually, someone did. A few crew members sprinted up the small dock stairs, flinging themselves across the railings to safety. The rest of the crew, Ingvar included, did the same thing. The bear went into a charge, running straight for the stragglers of the group and hideously gashing a young crew member's calf open with its sharp claws. The young man was lying on the deck on his back, bleeding profusely. Other crew members jumped in to help him, applying first aid and stopping the bleeding. Meanwhile, Ingvar returned to the railing to see what the bear was doing. It was still just beneath the steps, looking up at them and grunting. After a while, it got bored and went to the shore about a hundred yards from the ship. The fisherman watched in awe as the bear splashed out from the water with a seal in its jaws within a few moments. The water and the bear were painted red as the bear thrashed the corpse of the seal around. It brought the seal near to the ship and ate it in front of the crew, forcing them to realize their own mortality and the realization that it could have been them five minutes earlier. No one dared to return to the rudder of the ship for the next few hours as the bear finished its meal and proceeded to lie down, still keeping the crew in its sights. Eventually, Ingvar decided to call emergency services to dispatch a helicopter and hopefully scare the bear away. A helicopter arrived shortly and the bear got up and ran away from the whirring of the helicopter's rotors. The crew rejoiced as their stalker was finally gone and they could finish their repairs with armed assistance. The injured fisherman's bleeding had stopped shortly after the attack, but he was still airlifted to Upernavik for observation. The rest of the crew went to Upernavik, where they took a much-needed break while waiting for their friend to be discharged from the clinic. <laughs>